Hi everyone. Uh, today's lesson, which is the first one, is going to be on vector spaces, linear independence, and bases. Bases, so that would be a basis for a vector space. So first we'll start with vector spaces. The most familiar example of this is um, n-dimensional real space, so Rn, which you would have had in your undergraduate classes, um, you know, your undergraduate linear algebra classes and whatnot. So we'll denote the real numbers with an R like that. <clears throat> There'd be n-dimensional real space, um, especially R3. And I'm going to see if I can adjust the uh, There we go. So R3 would be what you would have used to do most of your calculations in um, you know, your undergraduate level uh, vector calculus class, things like that. So you have divergence, gradient, and curl. And um, so vector spaces, especially finite dimensional ones, which is most of what we're going to deal with, and certainly all of what we're going to deal with in this class. They're all analogous to that in some way. <clears throat> um, and what you would have done in your undergraduate classes is related to what we're doing here, but that would be really with um, all that stuff would apply to the components of vectors more. So we're looking at vector spaces in a three-dimensional space, typically. <coughs> um, independent of what basis you choose, whereas in in your undergraduate classes, typically, you know, you have this assumed orthonormal basis in the background that you're basing everything off of, and you're using coordinates relative to that background basis. Um, we'll be looking at things more fundamentally, and you can do it in terms of any basis. So a more abstract notion of a vector space is helpful um, because there are things besides Rn that are vector spaces um, <clears throat> and the math for them will work out similarly or in fact they'll be the same if they're finite dimensional as Rn. So anything, any intuition that you have for Rn would be applicable to those other sorts of vector spaces. Um, examples might be the set of polynomials up to degree 2 <clears throat> on an interval would be a, a three-dimensional vector space. So what is a vector space in the more abstract sense? I would say we're going to right now go into a little bit more detail than the textbook does <clears throat> just for this first vector and tensor algebra and calculus section of the course. Um, the textbook is written kind of assuming that you've had a graduate level course in abstract algebra or at least, you know, uh, an advanced undergraduate course in it, like a senior level one. Um, and typically, Penn State students um, don't really get exposed to that in engineering. So <clears throat> we'll just establish enough of the background there for it to work out. So a vector space is a set of objects called vectors that can be added to each other and multiplied by scalars to yield other vectors. So scalars being members of a scalar field, which would typically be 
the real or complex numbers. And within the context of this class, it's always going to be real numbers. So write that down. Well, first, so a, a vector space would be understood as a vector space over a field. So it could be a vector space over the field of reals. So that would mean that you multiply them by real numbers. <clears throat> or a vector field over the complex numbers. So <clears throat> the thing that you multiply them would be complex numbers. Um, and you can deal with that in relativity and um, you know quantum mechanics and everything. They they run into complex vector fields, but within the context of Newtonian continuum mechanics, we're always going to deal with real vector space. So a real vector space and we'll call this one V is a set of elements called vectors And we'll denote them as a lowercase letter with a bar under it when we're handwriting. <clears throat> but you notice in the textbook, and we'll do this in the homework as well, there'll be a lowercase bold letter. A vector space will be an uppercase calligraphy letter. Um, so in LaTeX, that would be math cal. M-A-T-H-C-A-L is the tag that you would use to um, get that font. And I sent out uh, an invitation earlier for all of you to collaborate <coughs> to view the, uh, the homework template on Overleaf. So um, let me know if you didn't get that. All right. Um, and the vector space is closed. Closed under linear combination of its elements. So <clears throat> that means alpha u plus beta v is an element of, so this is, this symbol here that I just wrote is, is an element of or is contained in um, the vector space v. And then this is for all alpha and beta in the real numbers for all u and v in v. <clears throat> so all that means is that um, if we have two elements in the vector space v, or any number of elements in the vector space v, as long as it's finite, um, <clears throat> then a linear combination of them is also a member of the vector space v. One of the consequences of this is that a vector space has a unique zero vector. <clears throat> 
which will denote as zero. <coughs> Satisfying zero is equal to scalar zero times a, where a is a vector. For all a in the vector space, and um, zero plus a is equal to a for all a in the vector space. <coughs> now, without um, without any additional structure like an inner product or you know R three have the cross product, um, there isn't really any way of multiplying vectors together necessarily to get either a scalar or another vector. Um, the inner product, most of the vector spaces that you'll run into have an inner product. So you can, in other words, a scalar product or a dot product, you might call it. <coughs> and that gives a bunch of extra useful structure to it. Um, R3 has the cross product. Um, but the other vector spaces that you run into won't have something analogous to a cross product. That's something that's very special about R3. All right, if we pick a few vectors, a set of them, that are members of the vector space V, So we'll say that this set of vectors G is equal to, we'll use curly braces to denote a set P, Q, R, and S. Um, all four of those in V. Then the set of all linear combinations of the elements of this set of four vectors called G is also a vector space, and it's called the span of those four vectors. Okay, W as we've defined it here, which is the span of G, um, and we can also denote that so we'll use span in that way, um, you know, to denote it as the, the vector space spanned by <coughs> a set of vectors. Um, it is a vector subspace 
of v. And if um, if the span of g is all of v, then g, you know, p, q, r, and s would be called a uh, a spanning set of v. So if G is a spanning set of V, then every element of V can be expressed as a combination of the elements of G. But if it's just a spanning set, <coughs> then this combination is not necessarily unique. There could be more than one way of combining the elements of G, you know, those four vectors in this case, to, um, to create any given vector of V. So if we had R2 and say we had three vectors in R2, then you know it's, it's not going to be a unique combination because there'd be multiple ways of expressing any given vector in terms of those three. <clears throat> if G is linearly independent, which we'll get to in a second here, then the combination is unique and G would be a basis for V. See whether the uh, eraser. Nope. Gotta do it this way. Okay. All right, so next we'll define what linear independence is, since that uh, is quite important for whether something is a basis or not. <coughs> so a set of vectors say G again is equal to V sub i. 
with i going from 1 to n. So here g is a set of n vectors which we've indexed by i. So it would be i.e. g is equal to v1, v2, all the way up to vn is what that notation that I just wrote up top means. <coughs> is called linearly independent. If <clears throat> this equation alpha one, that doesn't look like a one. V one plus alpha 2 v that hmm, not sure what happened there <clears throat> 2 plus which is equal to the sum i going from 1 to n <clears throat> alpha i v i. So this is just a, a shorthand summation notation for what we had just written up there. Um, so it's linearly independent. If that equals zero, so this equation for the alphas <coughs> has only the trivial solution, <coughs> which would be that all of the alphas are zero, the scalar zero. And that would be for all i in one, two, <clears throat> so in other words, there's not a way of taking a linear combination of the elements in a linear independent, linearly independent set of vectors and getting the zero vector unless the scale or multiplying all of the elements is zero. A basis is a linearly independent set of vectors that spans v. So that would be a basis for v. So I'm going to abbreviate <coughs> linearly independent like this um, so that it doesn't take as long to write. Given a vector space v, um, at least a finite dimensional one, which is all that we're going to deal with here, um, 
all bases for V have the same number of elements. And that number is called the dimension of V. And we could denote that <clears throat> that way. Um, if any vector is added to a basis, then the resulting set is linearly dependent, so not linearly independent. And we'll show that. Whoopsies, drop my pen. <clears throat> there it is. So let's say that we have a basis for V. We'll call it F. So if f is a basis for v, then for all v in the vector space v, so for all vectors in v, um, this notation is there exists, and this one is a unique, is what the exclamation point there is. So there exists a unique set of scalars, which will say, vi i going from 1 to n such that that's what the st is going to mean v is equal to the sum i going from 1 to n of v i the scalar times f i the vector <coughs> we're going to introduce a summation convention um, so these i's here are indices and the summation convention says that if there is a repeated index it implies summation over the number of elements that are there. So we're going to denote that just VI FI, like that. So whenever you see repeated indices, they're called dummy indices, and that means that you sum over them. If there's just an index hanging out that doesn't get repeated, <coughs> then it's a, called a free index, and you don't sum over it. And let's say that we had something like that has two indices. So 
this object A here would be a list of n times n numbers, <coughs> n for the i index, n for the j index. Um, is equal to the sum. You see j is repeated here and i isn't. So i is what's called a free index. So there are going to be n of these. So for each i, this is the formula that you would use to calculate what that resulting scalar is. Um, important thing. So you can always, if you have a dummy index, um, you can change it out for another index that you're not using, right? So if I had... Right, we're summing over all of those. Um, so this is just some number. Since these are all scalars, and you see we're um, multiplying, we're summing over i, we're summing over j, and we're summing over k. Um, if I wanted to say I was doing some mathematical manipulation trying to prove that the left-hand side of something was equal to the right-hand side of something else, um, I might want to combine terms or something. I could replace the I with like an L. So, you know, this would be the same as A, L, B, J, C, K, D, L, E, J, F, K. So in other words, you can change indices to your heart's content. Um, and you can change free indices as long as you change them on both sides of the equation consistently. Um, so it's not like there's something specific about them. So you don't, I is not the X direction. It's an index that goes from one to n, and the same with j and k. Um, an important thing when you are messing around with indices, make sure that you don't end up in a situation where you use an index more than twice. So you should never have like a, i, b, i, c, i. Um, one of those you should have chosen to be a different letter uh, because it doesn't mean anything. At least not if you're going to use the summation convention. Now and then it'll come up, <clears throat> something like that, like when you do um, spectral theory. You know, so you want to say diagonalize a symmetric matrix, you can run into situations where that happens um, and you'll write summation not implied if you have something where you actually need like an AI, BI, CI. Oopsies. 
if you have a, a situation where you need to run in, where you need to do that, if you're talking about a single element, then you would just write summation not implied. And um, if you need to sum over i, then actually write the sum. So the only time that I can think of that you'll need to do it is if we're using what's called the spectral representation of a matrix or of a tensor. So the only time that I can think of it would be some tensor T, which we'll denote this way, is equal to the sum I going from 1 to n of lambda i e i tensor product e i. Um, and we'll get into what that means later, but that's the only time that I can think of where you're going to end up with things of that form. And just, just write the sum out when that happens. <coughs> All right, so back to our proof that you can't add an element to a basis and have something that's uh, linearly independent still. So we'll kind of separate this off. All right, so let's say that we make another set of vectors. So let's say that G is equal to the union of F, which we said is a basis. And the union is that. for some u in the vector space v. So this union here, g, is equal to f1, f2, all the way up to fn, and u is what that means. Um, all right. Well, since F is a basis for V, and U is an element of V, Then we know that there exists a unique combination of scalars u i i going from 1 to n such that u is equal to u i fi here we're using the summation convention all right so in that case if we have u1 f1 plus u2 2 plus U <clears throat> N F N and then minus one times U. Um, that always is going to equal the zero vector because this here is ui fi is equal to u, 
and this is equal to minus u over here. And uh, you know this coefficient here, even if u is the zero vector, um, this coefficient here is still one in front of u. So that is a non-zero scalar in front of it. So we have a non-trivial combination of the elements of g here, which is the elements of f plus u, that equals the zero vector. So g is linearly dependent regardless of choice of u. Even if u is the zero vector, we don't get a basis. So g is linearly dependent regardless of our choice of u. All right, that's going to conclude the uh, first lesson then. And in the next one, we'll talk about change of basis, among other things. Um, and I would say, you know, reread chapter one in the book um, and start going through chapter two. Again, I know I signed you to read them uh, this week. Chapter two is pretty long, um, and I don't expect you to necessarily understand all of it, you know, from the get-go. So it's just the more times you read through it, and we'll do lectures on it, um, it'll, it'll process. But some of that, especially at the end, the Cayley-Hamilton theorem and everything, and those principal invariants, they end up being important, um, especially when you go to read some papers on people trying to develop constitutive models for, like, nonlinear elasticity and stuff. Those play a pretty major role. Um, all right, catch you in a little bit.